can you so what did you see right so that, so that within you you got a set of results although you're still going through them um but did you see the same as in trim and uh what were the the, the key elements that you saw yeah so the the essential things that we're looking for first and foremost is effects on the immune system so uh we want to know whether we're we growing the thymus and we want to know whether we are uh increasing the output of naive t cells and you can measure naive t cell output so naive meaning that the cell is new it has not encountered any you know foreign antigen yet so it hasn't divided too many times and those are the markers of new t cell production after a while the t cells tend to divide and it's harder to distinguish them from uh, other forms of t cells but um, as particularly early on we have something called recent thymic emigrants which have a particular kind of dna inclusion body that's lost pretty soon after they come out of the thymus so if you see an increase in recent thymic emigrants you can only see that if you've actually increased thymic function so uh, in fact we have seen uh, an increase in recent thymic emigrants uh, so that reproduces the original study and we've seen uh, an increase in uh, CD4 and CD8 T cell production uh, as measured by indirect methods and also some direct methods as well. So one interesting thing about the epigenetic aging clocks is that they can be used to not only infer what your biological age is, but also to infer what uh, other cell populations are doing in your body, such as naive T cells. And the uh, epigenetic aging clocks actually predict that we're increasing our naive CD4 and CD8 T cells. So we're still in the middle of our analysis of that, but we have some direct uh, we have direct results that support that, as well as these indirect results from the aging clocks. So we're pretty pleased to see this. And this is true in people even of advanced ages, and we have not, uh, we have not found yet uh, an age beyond which we cannot see positive effects on the immune system. But uh, as I said, we're still in the middle of our analysis, so we have ways to go to really nail that down in detail. Yeah, just there, I was wondering whether you think like the thymus could get to a point where it's unrecoverable. So it sounds like that doesn't happen. Well, uh, there's all kinds of ways yeah. that this could play out. But um, we ran, ran across recently some evidence that suggests that there is still some minimal thymic function, even up to the age of 104 to 107 in, in that range. And uh, if that's the case, then it may be that you can fan those flames back to life again, even at, at very advanced ages. So one of the things we actually want to do is to extend the age range to beyond 80 at this point. Uh, we actually have some people who wanted to get in the trial who were um, not able to do so before they turned 81, and we'd like to be able to include them. We had a couple people who were quite notable in TrimXA who got into the trial at an age of almost 81, like 80.99 <laughs> years of age. And so they, they technically qualified and got in, and they did quite well. One of them took up uh, track racing and started running 5K races and beating his own uh, uh, records and beating other people in the trial, and getting, you know, medals, you know, that he was very proud of and bragging that, you know, he wasn't even trying and that it did nothing hurts and things like that. So we love oh. this guy. Another guy uh, was not a track star, but at the end of the trial, he wanted to come back in again because he noticed that he was getting luxurious growth of hair on his legs and, you know, elsewhere. And it was turning black again, which we don't have documentation because we took uh, pictures of his hair on his head rather than on his legs or you know, uh, body. But um, uh, he, he would like to get back in. And under the tr current trial rules, we can't let him in. So we're, we're looking to allow people to re-enter the trial after they've been off treatment for a year, and also to enter the trial at, at ages greater than 80. So that um, uh, provision is being made right now. We're rewriting the trial plan, and we will be submitting that ASAP to include more people because we really do want to know what the upper age limit is for this. Ultimately, when this becomes 
a, a normal thing. When people go in for their aging treatments, uh, they're going to be going in at younger ages. I predict that people will want their thymus regenerated, you know, in their fifth decade of life or sixth decade of life in their 40s or 50s uh, when this becomes an ordinary kind of medical intervention. But for right now, there's many, many people who are, you know, getting up there in age and we would like them to be able to benefit as well if we can show that that's possible. So we would really like to know if there's an upper age limit and if so, what it is. Uh, and we don't know that yet. Uh, could you talk about some of the other effects? You said you, you mentioned this guy who seems to be able to run run better than before. Yes. Um, what other impacts apart from the kind of improvement in the immune system? Yeah, so the, this extraordinary um, effect on physical fitness, which we didn't really notice in, in trim, uh, but became more evident because we just kept getting testimonials from people that they were bursting with energy. And then in trim X, we had an opportunity to do something we couldn't do in trim. And that was to test people before and after treatment for their physical fitness in a variety of different ways. Uh, our headquarters in Torrance happens to be at a large medical campus, which has many testing facilities very close to us that allow people to have muscle strength tested and, and lung capacity, that sort of thing tested. And so we took advantage of that by allowing people to sign up for these tests on an elective basis. And so we didn't have uh, vast numbers of people doing this, but we did have some. And the people who signed up for this had an extraordinary increase in muscle strength, which we were able to document and uh, reaches high statistical significance despite the small number of people involved. Uh, and one of the most extraordinary things is VO2 max, which is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a measurement of your maximum lung capacity when you're exercising. Uh, and it correlates with age-related morbidity and mortality. And uh, VO2 max increased quite a large amount, like 26%. And normally mm. this is something that cannot be achieved unless you're an elite athlete uh, training very hard for long periods of time. And these are people who just, you know, went on our treatment for a year without really trying to uh, augment their physical fitness in any particular way. And yet they saw this as a side effect. So we're hoping to document this uh, in more people as we go forward, uh, as we go into the next couple tranches of, of uh, Trimex. Uh, and more and more people are signing up for this sort of thing because the word is getting out and people are getting more excited about it. So we do ho hope to have much more data, but you know we're pretty excited about this so far. This is not something that actually happens with described treatments that we're aware of to this point. Uh, growth hormone makes your muscles big, but according to the scientific literature, it doesn't make your muscles stronger unless you combine it with testosterone. And we don't do that because testosterone is a pro-involuting hormone as is estrogen. So we don't want to defeat ourselves by you know, in involuting the thymus at the same time we're trying to grow it. And yet our people get stronger anyway. And we think it's because of a combination of growth hormone with DHEA and perhaps even with metformin. So uh, uh, this is a very interesting thing. Along with this, we've seen significant reductions in body fat, like the 14% reduction in percent body fat, you know, kilograms of fat loss, increases in lean body mass. And this is really with uh, instructions to people before they even enter the trial, not to change their lifestyle. For example, not to change the amount of exercise that they do because we have to have a measurement against the baseline that's a reliable baseline. So you can't change your baseline or otherwise we're not sure what's going on. But after a year of treatment, one of the ladies just asked for permission to exercise more. And I decided, you know, if she really is bursting with energy and she just has to do this, maybe that's a treatment effect. So what the heck, go ahead. But even before that, you know, she had these tremendous improvements in muscle strength. So we've seen this actually, particularly in women. In, in many ways, the women get stronger proportional, you know, proportionally to to their starting strength, uh, more than more so than the men do sometimes. But uh, but both sexes have shown a benefit. So we're pretty excited about that. I mean, one of the things that uh, is a practical version of, of this kind of testing is sitting and standing. So if you sit on a stool and you have to sit up and stand down. Uh, 
a stand up and sit down as many times as you can in 30 seconds. Uh, that's a measure of frailty. And a lot of people I learned recently, they one reason that people have to get institutionalized as they get older is they can't even stand up off the toilet, you know, so they have to have people helping them. They can't do things on their own. And our people showed large improvements in the sit stand test, even though they all did pretty well to start with. So, you know, this has real world practical significance if we can improve your strength, also your balance, uh, because, you know, part of being able to sit up and stand down is not falling over in the process of doing that. So if you don't fall over, you don't break your hip, you know, so that extends your lifespan a long time, saves tremendous amounts of money, you know, treating your broken hip. And, you know, uh, we think that, you know, sarcopenia is a big problem with aging. And if we're reversing that, giving people greater physical strength, not only, you know, will they last longer, but they'll have a happier life and, you know, um, everything will work out better for the people that know them as well.